Right, thank you for staying with your world on NTV Kenya this morning. We now want to shift gears and talk about the World International Health Day, which is today. We want to focus on the inequalities around access to healthcare in Kenya. And I have a very interesting panel that should be coming up to help us break down this conversation and how that the, the gaps in our healthcare system can be plugged. But just before that, we want to, you to be part of this conversation, by the way. And on our question of the day this morning, we ask you, what has been your biggest challenge in trying to access healthcare in Kenya? What has been your biggest challenge in trying to access healthcare in Kenya? Be part of this conversation by engaging us on Twitter using the hashtag new normal. You can tweet us at NTV Kenya and at Victor Kiprop underscore. You could also follow the conversation and uh, on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to call in or SMS, our lines should be opening in a short while below your screen but just before that let's give you another small update uh, from across the continent of africa and more than 1800 inmates escaped prison in southern nigeria on monday after a heavily armed gang attacked the prison using explosives in one of west Af the, uh, with the west african country's largest jailbreaks Imo State Correction Service spokesman James Muduba in a statement said that the attackers blasted their way into the Oweri prison in Imo State, engaging guards in a gun battle and breaking out inmates. No group claimed responsibility for the assault, though President Muhammadu Buhari called the attack an act of terrorism carried out by anarchists and urged security forces to capture the assailants and the escaped detainees. <laughs> Right, and for almost 10 years, volunteers of a Dhaka Muslim Association have taken it upon themselves to provide unidentified de the dead with p proper funerals. Lamin Mandiang, the Secretary General of the Association for Perfection and Mercy, says, and I quote, During our investigations in 2010, we saw that their known Muslim bodies were buried according to amenities of Islam. We say to ourselves that we cannot be in a country with a Muslim majority and these bodies are not treated in the best way. Okay, and to North Africa now, and pre the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, has praised Tunisia's democracy after meeting with President Kais Saied during his first visit to the country, which is largely supported by European funds. Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, said that Tunisia has made an important choice, the choice of a democratic pluralist society based on the rule of law and individual freedoms. Right, we're ready to kick that discussion and we asked you, of course, on our question of the day, what are the sum of the challenges? What challenges have you faced in trying to access healthcare in Kenya? What has been the biggest challenge, your biggest challenge, rather, in trying to access healthcare in Kenya? Remember, you can tweet us at NTV Kenya and at Victor Kiprop underscore. Use the hashtag new normal. You can also follow the conversation on Facebook and Instagram. But just for now, let's start that conversation. And in studio, I'm joined by uh, Alan Malechi, is the Executive Director of the Kenya Legal and Ethical uh, Issues Network. Welcome to the show, Alan. All right. Joining us virtually from South Africa is Waruguru Wanjau. She's a public health specialist and also the technical advisor of the Africa Health Agenda International Conference. Uh, welcome to the show. And then also virtually joining us is Caroline Sakwa. She's the Gender Program Director at Shofco. All right. We'll also be joined shortly by Susan Mochache. She's the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Health. And just to kick that off, Alan, I want to start with you. The, the, the theme for this year for the World Health Day is around building a fairer and healthier world. Just talk to us about uh, the theme uh, for this year considering the inequalities that we've always seen in our healthcare system. Uh, thank you for having me. 
on the show and indeed the theme for World Health Day is more than appropriate in terms of the inequalities we have seen that have been brought about by the COVID pandemic. Over the last 12 months we have witnessed the fact that it is the people who are more poor, it is the people who are more discriminated, it's the people who have less access to finances that have been hardest hit by uh, COVID. Okay. Also globally, we have seen the fact that the richer countries have been able to buy and amass vaccines beyond levels that are needed mm -hmm. and have been able to vaccinate more of their people as compared to the poorer countries. And so this theme is actually extremely timely, both from a local and a global context, for us to be able to interrogate what steps can be taken to ensure that we reduce inequalities that affect people from accessing health services but also living a healthy and meaningful life. All right. And, and at this point, let me just bring in Dr. Waruguru. Uh, she's joining us live from South Africa. Dr. Tari, definitely these gaps and, 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 and inequalities have always been there for quite some time now. But COVID-19 has, has made them a bit more pronounced, right? Right. All right. And we're still trying to get her. But we also have joining us virtually is Caroline Sakwa. She's a gender program director at Shofco. Caroline, good morning. If you can hear me, you are on the front line with regards to dealing with people in the informal settlements where, of course, um, COVID-19 has also been a problem. Uh, we're still trying to get Caroline as well. Um, we're trying to see if she's back with us. Yes, Caroline, if you're, if you're back with us, I, I wanted you to give us, to paint for us the picture um, of how people in these informal settlements, uh, the challenges they go through when they're trying to access healthcare, especially at such a critical time. So, um, Caroline, thank you for inviting me to the show. Uh, in terms of informal settlements, of course, we are talking about affordability with regards to accessing medical health care. The issue of affordability because most of the people in informal settlements are working in the informal sector. So, definitely, they are locked out of jobs. They are not able to afford proper medical care. And, of course, we have facilities in uh, slum areas, informal settlements, like a few government facilities and uh, as looking at facilities you look at the resource resourcefulness of these facilities sometimes these uh informal settlement dwellers might need special care like specialized treatment Hi. where are the specialists they are outside kibera they are outside informal settlements madari and mukuru so we find the informal settlement dwellers have the issue of mobility to move around to outside the informal settlements to look and seek for more specialized care and of course, issue of access to insurance. You find the informal settlement dwellers have to foot 100% of their bill when they seek medical care. Whereas uh, vast people with insurance covers, you, you, you see they are supported in footing their bills and they, there's less financial constraints. So the issues of affordability, resourcefulness of these facilities within informal settlements are some of the challenges we're experiencing in informal settlement with regards to access to healthcare. Thank you. Okay, and and maybe for the last one year, then how what has been your experience trying to, of course, um, solve part of this uh, issues that you're talking about? For the past one year during the COVID pandemic, of course, there's been so much uh, work with regards to uh, ensuring the informal settlement well as access uh, healthcare. We've had the facilities by the government. We also have NGOs that have or are running hospitals and clinics within the informal settlement, which uh, have come in to really ensure that the informal settlement dwellers are getting access to medical care, but there's still a challenge. Then through the community health strategy with the government, there's been so much work with the community health volunteers and community workers in reaching out to members of the community to be able to access this care which is also still minimal, but there's been so much work with regards to sensitization on issues of COVID, sensitization on where they can go for testing and get support. And also through the government it in initiative, we've seen isolation centers being opened in informal settlement, like for example, in Kibera, we had the Kibera South Health Clinic, which is now government owned, put as an isolation center for at least people coming from informal settlements. So okay. that's a plus with regards to 
reacting to issues of COVID. But we're also looking at sanitation as sanitation, our environment, our health. So throughout the last year, there's been so much issues of dealing with sanitation so that we are able to promote proper health within informal settlements. So with other partners, there's been so much sanitation activities, and this has really helped in managing and even managing the COVID pand pandemic in informal settlements. All right. Yeah. And, and maybe if we have Waruguru uh, back with us, uh, Daktari, what I was asking you is what COVID-19 has, has done is just to magnify, um, you know, issues that have been here with us for decades, right? Yes, they certainly have. I think in terms of both the individual, so that we think about the individual who doesn't have access to care. So whether it's COVID or non-COVID, for those people who have COVID, the individuals who have access to more resources have options of where to go. And you know, as the resources decline, as there's the less access to, for example, ICU beds, there's people with resources are able to do that. But also I think on a systemic level, there's a problem uh, because it's difficult for people, it's difficult for the system to adjust. And so overall, the system has meant reduced access to care because the systems in some health systems, for example, the Kenyan health system is not always as strong. So that has also led to okay. um, inequality of care because of the lack of the strength of the health system from a systemic population level. Okay. And, and, and certainly, of course, this COVID situation, we've seen the number of people who have lost their jobs, the number of companies who have had to close shop. The, the, the unintended consequence is that, you know, even people who have had sort of come out of poverty have been pushed back. And once again, we have more people struggling to access this very critical services. Yes, and I think it always goes to show the importance of health when it comes to economics. I think people always think of health when, when you go to see the clinician or when you go to see the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that health is beyond that. It has systemic, it has social and very big economic effects. And this is when universal health coverage becomes important because the importance of it is that when someone needs healthcare, they're able to access it. In COVID, that has been much more magnified. There've been lots of appeals, even just not for, for the person to be able to get care, even for example, to be able to bury someone because of the big bills in led to ICU. And so one of the big components of healthcare that's not talked about enough all the time when it comes to access and fairness is how many people are pushed out of, pushed into poverty because of access to health. This has been magnified by COVID, but this happens across board. Um, and so I think it's important for us to realize the importance of having a health system that's very strong mm -hmm. is so that people are able to not have to choose between their life and feeding their family because that becomes a very difficult decision or their life and educating their children. All and right. again, that emphasizes the importance of a universal health system, even beyond COVID for all other things. Okay. And, and of course, uh, we, we've already been joined by Susan Mwachachi. She's the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Health. Welcome mm -hmm. to the show. Thank you, Victor. All right, Asante. Yeah. And, 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 the, and, and the theme for this year's World Health Day is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, building a fairer and healthier world. Yeah. But we live in a fairly unequal, uh, unequal world, you would argue. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that is why, uh, Victor, first and foremost, thank you for having me here. And uh, really, the essence of having a universal health coverage agenda is precisely to minimize that uh, inequality that may be uh, playing out because it's just ensuring that every, every Kenyan can be able to go to a hospital and access the services needed without them suffering a financial risk. That is what the whole issue of universal health coverage means. But I also wish to say that uh, for this year, I think we need to focus on the healthier nation because uh, we, we, we want to minimize the accessing the healthcare service. We want to ensure that, uh, you know, the kind of lifestyle that we live, the kind of uh, environment that we live in, is one that promotes, uh, you know, the avoidance of certain uh, diseases. And I think COVID has also shown us that uh, the discipline of washing hands mm -hmm. uh, has worked to prevent uh, a lot of illness, uh, particularly in children. We are seeing less cases of diarrhea and other infections that come because, you know, somebody did not clean their, their hands. So that, that really should be our focus. How can we prevent illness and now deal with the curative side or the, the issue of accessing really when it is, re, uh, it is absolutely necessary. And that's why when we talk about universal health coverage, our key focus is around primary health care. 
And when you talk about primary health care, you've moved into the dom domain of preventive health. Mm -hmm. So we, we definitely, uh, we, the UHC is anchored on the issue of having community health volunteers and the community health network being the most critical priority focus because through community health volunteers we are able to one work very closely with families to ensure that uh, you know they go for example for a very early di diagnosis uh, sometimes and prevent uh, accruing very high costs because you know you're going to the hospital very late in the day of course uh, when you have community health volunteers they also are trained to do some bit of counseling so again when you're talking about mental health for example those issues can be addressed very quickly when a health worker is in the community with the families and uh, in things like nutrition you know, and uh, good hygiene practices. Mm -hmm. So when we are talking about a uh, universal health coverage, we first must talk about uh, the healthier us. Mm -hmm. The healthier us who also, you know, live a lifestyle that uh, prevents us from getting the non-communicable diseases, for example. Mm -hmm. We know very well that high blood pressure, cancer, these are diseases that come because, of the, I mean, one of the attributing factors is high stress, mm -hmm. lack of physical exercise. Mm -hmm. So I would want to say that uh, in this year's uh, theme for a fairer and healthier, mm -hmm. I am happier to talk about the healthier side mm -hmm. and also recognizing that COVID, mm -hmm. uh, in as much as it has really come with its own challenges, both socially and economically, it has done one thing. It has helped us in dealing with the prevention of diseases that come out of interacting with dirty hands into the mouth and mm -hmm. such like things. One would argue that the healthier and the fairer sides are not are inseparable. <laughs> Um, they, they sort of are because uh, that's true because mm -hmm. when you talk about, for example, the community health services, mm -hmm. the primary level care, you are talking about access mm -hmm. because then it means that CHV or that community volunteer is actually accessible by families, by mm -hmm. communities. So perhaps Victor, I may want to agree with you yeah. that even at the primary uh, level, it's about the access, okay. the ability of uh, people going to lower level facilities for simple, uh, you know, uh, medical issues, you know, and, and that ability for you to go to a level two or a level three to get your, you know, not very complicated illness, perhaps a malaria issue, the diagnosis that you have malaria, uh, the diagnosis that, uh, you know, your uh, high blood pressure has gone up, that should also be accessible at level two and level three. But, uh, you know, that would be another whole subject that we can also go into. Okay. And I'll come back to you and Dr. Aruguru about the issue of how, how exactly we define what is universal health coverage. Because mm. I would, there are people who would think universal health coverage means yeah. my grandmother in the village can access MRI fully paid by the government. But just before that, let me just bring in Alan at this point. Because Alan, we're talking about an issue um, and I think even the UN uh, recognizes access to health as a human right. Just talk to us about the basic definition of what uh, this would mean uh, in a Kenyan context. So I think uh, I would like to first of all state that indeed not only the UN but also the Kenyan constitution recognizes the right to health mm -hmm. as a right for every person in Kenya and you also have a health act that does so. And for us to be able to realize the elements around the right to health and part of what the principal secretary has talked about on preventative health, curative health, palliative health, we need to ensure that we have policies, we have resources, and we efficiently roll them out and explain them to people and be able to have a plan because what we have learned from different jurisdictions is that you can't provide everything to everyone at the same time. But what you can clearly do is have a plan that progressively shows that from 2010 to 2015 will be able to reach X number of people mm -hmm. with X number of services from that particular then. So that presence of a plan helps people know how much do we need to invest and how much do we need to be able to plan ourselves. So it is important that when we speak of a fairer and healthier uh, world mm -hmm. on World Health Day, we need to think through what plans have both the national government and county governments put in place that citizens can be able to track and say, 
I am sure by 2015 I'll be going to Makweni Hospital and not having to pay anything because okay. my governor has put into plan. So the progressive plans that are realized are important tools that need to be in place to see us reaching towards the pathway of being more fairer and more healthier as Kenyans. Okay. And speaking about plans, the Kenyan government has one I would say is quite ambitious one, which is to mm -hmm. roll out universal health coverage to mm -hmm. all the 47 counties by 2022. Mm -hmm. But just before I come back to the CS, let me bring in Dr. Waruguru. When we talk about universal health coverage, even from a continental view, what are we saying? Really confused. It's it's not what you're saying that you know every village in Kenya has an MRI. That mm -hmm. would not necessarily be what you mean. Mm -hmm. I think it's that all individuals in this context in Kenya have access to essential services without suffering financial hardship. Okay. So I think essential means we have understood the burden of disease in Kenya and the things that are most prevalent. Those services are available everywhere. You know, okay. where an MRI might not be essential for everyone, but it's available anywhere. And say without financial hardship, I don't think it means that people will always not pay mm -hmm. they will pay in some form but it's what kind of form are paid in have people been stratified so that vulnerable people are brought in so i think for us it's when we think of that grandmother back to the grandmother and what you see means to her is can she get the essential services without do having financial hardship mm -hmm. and for that grandmother that may mean something different compared to an urban person in nairobi okay. they might need different services and they might need to contribute because they have the ability to contribute but they'd contribute to a pool that would mean that again that grandmother has access to it but when they need maybe something more complex that pool allows them to then get that mri that they're able to get or that cancer care because they have contributed to a pool so i think the two words for kenyans to remember are essential services and financial hardship. Those are okay. the two things that underlie UHC, and I hope that that's where we're working towards in Kenya. All right, and let me just bring in the PS at this point, because PS, we, we launched this pro program last year. I think it should have been a pilot in four counties. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and uh, but COVID-19 happened in between, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure nearly every Kenyan is wondering what could have happened to that program? Mm -hmm. Where is it now? Yeah, uh, Victor, I, I of course want to just say that uh, you know, UHC is among the big four uh, agendas for government. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the midst of COVID, we are still moving towards uh, the realization of UHC. And to understand very well that uh, UHC is a journey, you know, and so w w having done the pilot and the pilot focused on putting, you know, inputting into the healthcare system, closing the gaps on H human resources, making sure that the gaps on, uh, you know, the health products and technologies, which are the medicines and all, are also provided for. It really, and making sure also that the facilities, for example, have access to water, have access to power, because those are very key uh, enablers in delivering uh, healthcare services. So the pilot phase focused a lot on that, and then it moved us to the national rollout of a still uh, inputting into the system trying to bridge the gap of health workers and that's how we ended up uh, you know employing an additional 8500 health workers and most of those were focused at the primary level level two and level three where we noticed that uh, more often than not you mm -hmm. will not get services because there is no personnel then we also realize there's a huge gap on pharmaceutical products in the country we have a gap of about 40 percent so again that was the focus of trying to close the gaps coming up with the essential medical list the essential equipment list and all that so that uh, we could again plug the gaps mm -hmm. now that was done last year and a bit of this year though uh, you know the resources were not where we expected them to be but we still are going to provide you know the, the the inputs but more importantly is the shift from input financing into insurance a UHC that offers a, 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 an essential uh, package of insurance to every Kenyan mm -hmm. especially the one who cannot afford and also have a mechanism that promotes those that can be able to pay for themselves to basically do that okay. so our engine and our driver for UHC now and going into the future is about 
availing that health insurance to every Kenyan. And actually, we have come up with a very robust uh, health insurance cover because it will take care of what you have talked about, the MRI services, the cancer treatments, the issues around, uh, you know, dental services, optical issues, mental health, for yeah. example, dialysis. All these will be services that somebody would get, uh, would have access to by just presenting the card. Let me say that His Excellency the President has launched that registration of the vulnerable members of society into the uh, NHIF insurance mm -hmm. scheme. And indeed, we are now at the tail end of uh, having all those uh, uh, identified indigents or vulnerable members, a million of them, because the target for this financial year is to just bring on board one million of them. Okay. So we are just at the tail end of completing that exercise, and they will then be able to get an NHIF card so that they can be able to go, whether it's a private facility or a public facility, okay. as long as the service is rated within what we will refund as NHIF, the Kenyan can get services everywhere. Okay. That is a sustainable way of financing a universal health coverage. All right. And I'm sure the, the question I would have wanted to ask you next is for these four counties, has it worked? And I'm sure you're ready to mm. respond to that. But we have to take a very quick break. Um, at the end of this break, of course, we will be coming back with my panelists to continue this discussion. Don't go anywhere. of pain you need a solution that you can trust to provide effective relief and is gentle on the stomach try panadol advance for relief from headaches body aches and fever with panadol's optizob formula the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach quickly absorbs and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes for fast and effective pain relief that you can trust try panadol advance this has been medifax for panadol Introducing Ushindi Cream Baso. Ushindi Cream Baso with Oxybrite removes stains effortlessly and brightens colors. Available in 1 kilogram and 800 gram bars and 175 gram tablets. Also available in all your favorite variants. Ushindi, a quality product from Pwani Oils. After a year full of uncertainty, Kenya's leaders of tomorrow will soon sit for their KCPE and KCSE national exams. Join the Daily Nation team in wishing our candidates success in the Faoluna Daily Nation campaign. Log on to success.nation.co.ke from your phone and send the candidates details and a heartfelt personalized message for only 299 Kenya shillings or include a photo of the candidate for only 999 Kenya shillings. The messages of hope will be published in the Daily Nation Junior Spot Magazine every Monday and My Network Magazine every Friday for the duration of the campaign. Campaign runs from 5th March till 15th April 2021. To see Kenya na Daily Nation. You know how we do it. No kupatia mama moto moto. Sorry moto moto concerning our reggae fraternity. Pale kwenye jam don vibe. We're giving you all the link ups of our two five four reggae artists and also Jamaican artists. And of course, kama kwa mazee catch me live on the decks. Mazee kwa pitu reggae no masana. All the way from Kingston, Jamaica. Baka two five four Nairobi City. Send in your request. Pale kwenye hashtag jam don K. Yeah man, they call me DJ Mo, the roughest and the toughest. And I and I, the Caribbean queen, Miss Katiwa. Call me the energy god, MC Yawochi, don't you go nowhere. Cause this is MTV Jump Down.
Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. All right, thank you for staying with your world on NTV this morning. We are talking about the inequalities in our health system and how we can plug them. Just before we went for the blood break, uh, P.S. Susan Mochachi was talking to us about the universal health coverage. But just before we go back to her, remember we'd ask you to be part of this conversation by tweeting us at NTV Kenya and at Victor Kiprop underscore using the hashtag new normal. The question was, what has been your biggest challenge in trying to access healthcare in Kenya? And let's see uh, some of the feedback that you have been sending us so far. Yes, Honorable Seron Jr. says corruption, dictatorship, and high cost of service. We'll be revisiting the cost, the issue of affordability. Victor Ote says financial constraints when you have a patient that is in critical condition and can't be attended when you don't, you have not paid for the treatment. This is sometimes, sometimes makes them die in our hands or in our bed. Of course, the PS is here. All right, Jared Ondu, he says the biggest challenge is poor road networks, infrastructure, and high cost of living. That is, of course, part of the issues that sometimes are overlooked. Wahome Wambugu, he says, lack of drugs in government facilities. Thank you, Wahome. All right. Uh, just as Mutishi says, most of the referral hospitals are not offering outpatient services. We are forced to seek medication from private institutions. It is very expensive. Thank you, Justice. Uh -huh. Mokality Asudi says, lack of drugs and poor diagnosis. Uh huh. Thank you. And then we have Peter T. Peter. He says the cost of treatment. Thank you, Peter. We have some more. Yes, Bri Bryon Brian Collins. He says long lines and poor healthcare services. Thank you, Byron. Was it Brian? And then Gilbert Milimo. He says every other attendant at the hospital thinks you have COVID-19. <laughs> Thank you, Gilbert. Of course, we'll have the PS and other panelists respond to some of those comments. Uh, and remember, our question of the day was, what challenges have you faced in trying to access healthcare in Kenya? PS, uh, clearly from the feedback, one of the, the most common issue for most people is the issue of affordability. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, universal access is about, the universal health coverage is about accessing health services without facing a financial uh, mm -hmm. risk. Because what's happening today, some families end up selling everything that they have because of trying to get resources to get a treatment for one of their loved ones. I mean, all of us, in one way or another, end up contributing to uh, have a harambe around uh, a, a sick uh, relative or a friend that we have. So UHC really aims to address those very issues. Address the issue of cost, address the issue of availability of medicines, address the issue of um, being able to have the necessary infrastructure around a health facility, mm -hmm. including water, power, and uh, roads. Because obviously, you know, you, there are certain places where you go to and you can't actually get to the facility. A pregnant mother is trying to reach a, a certain center, but the road just becomes totally impossible. Mm -hmm. And that is why in this financial year and the last financial year, the ministry is responsible for roads, the ministry responsible for water, ICT, uh, pow uh, power, have all been working, you know, behind ensuring that all health facilities are provided with that infrastructure. And that is being driven by those respective uh, ministries. But it's important to note that the government was very deliberate to say, let us address the issue around health facilities. Have we completed? No. 
we have started that journey. We have covered several uh, facilities which now are uh, accessible by road. We have ensured that the power has been agreed, upgraded to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the three phase because that's what is required. So that enabling bit is one part of the matrix. Then there's an the issue now of dealing with the health facility. You've heard about the lack of personnel. You've heard about lack of diagnostic equipment and medicines. Mm -hmm. This now, Victor, brings me back to what I just said, that the government is focusing on supporting especially level two and level three, mm -hmm. working with the county governments to ensure that we have basic diagnostic equipment at that level of facility so that everybody is not coming up to level four, level five, level six and putting an unnecessary burden to those uh, healthcare facilities which should be focusing on more specialized care okay. but now you we, we as i say the pilot uh, the four pilot counties focused on us investing in to address those very issues but that is not a sustainable way that's what we now know mm -hmm. the only sustainable way of pushing this uhc agenda is providing people with an insurance cover so and addressing the issue of the cost of the service. So because that's the journey we are taking, the reforms at NHIF are ongoing. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that we realized was that even within, if you look at the, all the health facilities who are claiming uh, you know, to be paid by, through NHIF, you find that what we were compensating varies. Mm -hmm. So right now, NHIF is going to harmonize so that at the end of the day, if you have that cover, you have to go to where the, the, the services will be offered at that general cost. Again, bringing down the, the, the cost of healthcare. The other important thing, Victor, that uh, we are driving as a ministry and as a government is generally reducing the price of medicines. Mm -hmm. Because today, the, when you look at the overall cost of healthcare, 40% of it goes into pharmaceutical products. Mm -hmm. And we have already realized that actually our pharmaceutical products are quite expensive in comparison to other countries. So again, there's a very strong uh, work that is going on to make sure that those prices come down. And again, it's a whole government approach because we have to work with the treasury, we have to work with trade, and we must remove those barriers that cause the prices to be as high as they are. Then, uh, you know, the, the, the other important thing that I would like to say, Victor, is this, when you think universal health coverage, mm -hmm. think insurance. So since the president launched the UHC registration, we have now registered one million Kenyans. We are just at the tail end of finalizing. All these poor families who have been identified at the grassroots levels by the county governments uh, and, and their network there together with our national administration, those individuals will now not struggle to get the service. They mm -hmm. can use that card to go to any facility, private or public, to get access to services. And, and that is the future of UHC. Think NHIF insurance card for everybody who can't afford and for those that can afford that the mechanism is put around that to ensure that people don't default because one of the bad uh, the negative uh, or rather the thing that Kenyans do that doesn't help mm -hmm. somebody gets a super cover from NHIF mm -hmm. they pay for it of course when they get the cover then now when they have been told they are sick that is when they go and to start catching up on their uh, annual annual uh, payments mm -hmm. and you know when you're going to pay for your insurance your premium at uh, a certain point, you are going to have to wait for three months. Okay. So you see Kenyans struggling, coming with their card at the very last minute, and it cannot now help them. And if so that is why, that is why it is important mm -hmm. to have a mechanism where if you are earning some, uh, you, some livelihood, you are, you are even running an info, I mean the, the, the businesses in an informal setup, mm -hmm. or you are a farmer, mm -hmm. those individuals who can pay is to make sure that they don't default. They stay within the path of paying and, for their own good. And, and if families. I may catch you short there, right there, P.S., because I, I think Alan would, would, would tell you that we have had stories where mm -hmm. there are this mama bogas that you say and, and people with really uh, little income that have sacrificed to make sure that they get an HIF co cover. Mm -hmm. But Alan, w w we have situations where when you get to the hospital, NHIF tells you, you know, even after paying for all this long, the much we can pay is, I don't know, maybe for the bed alone or something of mm -hmm. that sort, where now they, 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 they get below your expectations. So I think, Victor, what the PS has said is an extremely rosy situation, but also what Kenyans are experiencing is that there are some facilities that are covered by NHIF, there are some that they are not, and mm -hmm. it would be great if the plans the government is making are made available to the public. The public can contribute to the conversation and the public can get the confidence to understand 
what is being set up and how does it eventually work for them. Indeed, insurance is one good way to go in terms of facilitating access to health, but I think most importantly, even as people have the insurance cards, we must ensure that we have sufficient public health facilities mm -hmm. uh, that are well stocked with commodities, as you heard from Jared and others, that there were no drugs and that others were facing long queues, maybe because there are not enough healthcare workers. So we need to look onto the four important things that ensure that health services are available, that health services are accessible, both in terms of information, both in terms of finances, and also that they're acceptable in the way that they provide the services to the people that they should be called culturally sensitive, and that the services that are provided are of good quality. Okay. And it would be indeed important to then know how then are we classifying who are these groups that will first get this cover mm -hmm. and how progressively will others eventually get that cover because the need is great and we have seen a number of situations even for those who have private insurance cover and you constantly pay your premiums mm -hmm. during this COVID time that has not been helpful and there are sometimes that gets exhausted. So again, we need to see how then do we invest more in health ensure there's more efficiency in how we utilize the money mm -hmm. that is given to us both from the government and mm -hmm. from the donors and ensure that there's no leakage, no corruption and that people have got public confidence to use public health services that have been well resourced. And I'm going to come back to the PS and the issue of corruption. But just before that, we have Caroline, and she's been dealing with people in informal settlements. Caroline, just talk to us about the uptake of, you know, medical insurance in this uh, informal settlements and the challenge of having to, you know, uh, the out-of-pocket expense every other time you need, um, you know, to uh, receive any health care service. Uh, okay, the uptake of insurance covers, like we know in informal settlements, most people don't have job like uh, white collar jobs. They're in informal sectors, like the mamamboga. Mamamboga maybe that five hundred a month. It's too much for this mamamboga because even paying rent and even feeding for the family, it's still high in terms of cost of living in informal settlements. Mm -hmm. So basically, they are using a lot of their out of court pocket cash to pay for medication, to pay for healthcare. And even maintaining to pay for regular monthly uh, uh, 500 for uh, an insurance cover like NHIF, that would be too expensive. But okay. as the Honorable has said, the UHC will boost uh, these NHIF covers for uh, extremely uh, poor families, especially in the informal segments. And I know the, pro the process have been going on in terms of registration of the female-headed households in the informal segments or the specific criteria the government had given. And the community health workers and volunteers are really registering the, the, the people to benefit from this. And I think this will be a plus and it will boost the mamambogas. It will boost uh, people who have no jobs and lack of finances in informal segments to be able to access the healthcare. And I like but that. Just yeah. giving them themselves to do the healthcare contribution on a monthly basis, this is a great challenge because even they're economically marginalized. They don't have jobs at the moment. They are locked out of jobs. Okay. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned the female he um, heads of households because uh, there's always a gender angle to ending this issue of inequality in access to health. Yeah. There, I know one of the criteria for one to be registered on you had seats, you have to be a female head of household too. That is one of the criteria. And I think it's also good because women out in the informal settlements are the ones taking care of sick children and sick families and all that. I know men also do that. But on an angle of female and gender issues, we find that the women carry the burden more in families. Okay. So, yeah, it's a plus for the government to include that kind of a criteria. Okay. And maybe to Dr. Waruguru then, because from uh, you have, uh, you know, you, uh, the perception or the view of the, the entire African continent. This is something that I, Kenya and other African countries are trying to implement. Do we have lessons from other places across the world or in Africa if this issue of UHC has actually worked or not? Yeah, I think there have been very good examples. And a lot of the time... The examples given are the ones for, you know, the NHS in England, ETC. But I think other good examples in countries closer to Kenya include examples such as Thailand, where Thailand has been very good at getting access to people across board, and they did it systematically and over time. So I think that's something to consider. I think our neighbor, Rwanda, are doing a very good job, especially of catching those people in vulnerable situations and people at the lowest level. So if you look at the 
in the Rwanda UHC system, you see that they're able to identify who is who is not able to get to pay. So even at the village level, so they've gone down to the village level, they found a criteria to identify who's poor in the village, including is your house touched, you know, and such basic things. So things that we can relate to. And then have payment mechanisms where the poorer people in that country pay very low levels. Okay. So, you know, one to two dollars ETC. So they're able to contribute to that. And then on top of that, they've put technology so that even those people in the village are reached. So they're using a lot of telemedicine ETC to reach people even in the village to be able to get access to care. So I think we can look at, yes, the ones who've been successful and I've had it for many years, such as the NHS, but looking at examples such as Thailand, which is something we can aim towards, and then Rwanda, which is closer to us and are in a similar situation, and really have looked at what does it mean to be a poor you know, person in a village who's a farmer and how do you give access to that person? And I think in Kenya, we'd also have to think about things like how do we give UHC to the nomadic community? You know, okay. some of our unique situations, but there are people who've done that and I think we can learn from other people in the region and other countries. Okay. And, and maybe to the PS then, uh, because clearly from the examples Doc mm. is giving, it can work. And if yeah. it has worked, especially in a mm. neighboring country in Rwanda, maybe it can work for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there was the issue of you know, that, that we pay and that we end up in hospital and mm -hmm. that it's not covered. Mm -hmm. And you guys are proposing a new one, I think uh, 6,000 shillings cover mm -hmm. for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about how this will work differently mm -hmm. and if it will solve the issues we've had currently. Uh, you see, uh, Victor, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm glad that uh, Warogoro has mentioned some of the countries which we have benchmarked with, particularly Thailand. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also now planted ourselves on that journey of, uh, you know, walking how they did and have now successfully covered the uh, majority of their most vulnerable members. Now, coming down to the issue of, uh, you know, uh, NHIF and KEMSA, who... I must say, are going to be the drivers. And, and now just talking about NHIF and the issues of all payments have not been made on time, things like that. We are well on track in reforming uh, the NHIF. A lot of work is going in there. We are working very closely with the development partners to really uh, restructure, reorganize NHIF to be a very lean and a very efficient institution. So as we speak here, you know, that work is going on because uh, we recognize obviously as government that if NHIF is the vehicle for delivering UHC, it must certainly be very efficient in the way uh, it uh, delivers its services. It must be not too big, lean enough so that we reduce the administrative cost of just running the NHIF. So those are things that are well on course. And if you recall, Victor, what we are now actually doing is implementing the recommendations that were made by the health uh, team of experts who were given the assignment of looking at what we need to do to make NHIF that institution that uh, you know uh, is efficient and also that is open accountable and transparent enough because you must have that even as you you know continue to roll out the health insurance amongst the most vulnerable and as well as promoting uh, you know regular payments by those that are in the informal sector so there's so much that is going on in in, in NHIF now uh, we are committed because what other option do we have NHIF has to work and it will work. I hope the, the reforms you're talking about can also extend to, to cancer. But just before, uh, the, the, before we, 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 I went to Dr. Waruguru, there was the issue of has it worked in these four pilot counties? Mm. Uh, I, as I said, Victor, you have to look at in, in what mode are you delivering UHC. Mm -hmm. In the pilot, we were basically inputting into the health system. We, re, uh, we gave resources to those four counties to hire. We gave them growing rights to be able to get medicines from cancer. We basically supported them to recruit community health volunteers and get them trained. Now, having done that and done it for the whole country last year, last financial year, and now we are now clear that the way forward is not to input finance, but rather to have the insurance as the mechanism that allows for the sustainable access to services in the country so that you go, you get treated, and NHIF reimburses that health facility mm -hmm. for the treatment that they have offered you. So really that is the outlook and we must separate input financing and 
the health insurance uh, you know mechanism okay and, and it, of course time is really running out and i have to perhaps start wrapping up alan maybe in in what we would say would be your closing remarks then uh there was the issue of the abuja declaration where i, I believe governments committed to invest 15 percent of their annual budgets in health and and if we look at ourselves uh various reports that we um for africa for kenya and other countries we are not meeting that target talk to us about the issue of increasing investments in this uh in this um in in, in health uh as we move towards of course plugging this uh, the gaps in inequalities in access to healthcare. I uh, thank you, Victor, and I think as we remember the Abuja Declaration, which remains extremely important, we must also remember that we have our Kenyan constitution that aspires to go beyond the Abuja Declaration by mm -hmm. ensuring that every Kenyan has the right to health. And I think the challenge we have to meet is to be able to see how do we increase resources given to the health sector from the taxpayer and less dependent on donor funding so that we can be guaranteed of sustainability and I believe for us to be able to do that we have to start thinking through how best do we efficiently use the resources we have, how best do we efficiently ensure there are no leakages, how best do we ensure that we strengthen public health facilities to be able to encourage more people to be able to attend to them. But in terms of increasing resources in the health sector, we definitely need to see both from the national and county governments what are their plans toward getting beyond Abuja. And I think that is a critical step that can be achieved by not only putting more money, but ensuring that efficiency in the use of the scarce money in the health sector is done extremely well. All right. Thank you, Alan. And, and maybe to Caroline, because when, when um, I, it must be you was talking about how this, this, this um, strategies have to be designed differently, because if you look at the challenges that are faced by people in informal settlements and people in perhaps rural areas compared to people in urban centers, they may not be the same. Is there a way, um, a, a better, let's say, strategy can be designed specifically for people um, in informal settlements to make sure that they indeed can be able to uh, access the healthcare, uh, as Alan says, is a human right? Oh, okay, within the informal settlements, uh, the best structure we can use is the community health strategy structure, where we have community health volunteers and community health workers who are able to work with families, as the Honorable has said, in terms of even identification of sick people in families, in homes, and also referring them to relevant and uh, relevant institution and facilities to get medical care. So we've done this within informal settlement, it has really worked. And also prevention, kind of uh, public awareness and sensitization. Prevention is the best, is the key cure for people not to get to really want access to medical care every time. So prevention strategies are also very, very important within the informal segment. All right. Yeah. Dr. Waruguru, in your, in your closing remarks, how do we use uh, UHC then to deliver uh, the right uh, health care to every Kenyan and make sure that we reduce the inequality and move towards equity in health care? I think we ensure that UHC is designed for Kenya. I mean, just like we've given examples, UHC in different countries has been designed for very for their particular um, population. And so I think it's identifying what are the needs of the Kenyan population, all the way from the grandmother in the village you talked about, to the person in the informal settlement that Carol is talking about. How do we design a program that's very specific to the Kenyan needs and that will keep on evolving as the needs of the Kenyan evolves. There's been examples given, for example, of high, high rates now of non-communicable diseases such as um, hypertension in Kenya. So how do we ensure, because giving hypertension care is very different from giving, for example, malaria care. So how do we ensure that as Kenya evolves, both the population, the disease burden, that we have a system that is catering to those needs um, across board. So from a nomad in Mandera to someone in one of those informal settlements to a growing city like Nakuru, how do we have a system that is responsive to all those people and changes as our disease burden and the needs of the people change? Okay. And also, most importantly, is how do we um, create a financial system that allows everyone to access care when they need it? Okay. So who can contribute? How can we make sure they contribute? 
um, and how can we make sure when they need care, however specialized like cancer care, that they're able to get care, again, underlying, responsive to the Kenyan population and oh. their needs. All right. And maybe to you, P.S., as we close then, uh, and I think my, all my speakers have given uh, what needs to be done, but government here, of course, the partners are the people to do these things. I want you to talk to us about the way forward in, from this, the government of the side to ensure that we all equally access mm -hmm. healthcare, the, the, um, independent of the issues mm -hmm. uh, that we face with mm -hmm. meat financial or otherwise. And I also want you to tie that to the issue of vaccines because mm -hmm. we've seen issues where those of us who are not so well off mm. may be locked out as people uh, or those who can afford actually import uh, vaccines for themselves. Mm. Okay, w one thing that I'd like to say is that as a country, we have now, you know, we are laying the foundations of uh, the UHC journey. As I said, it's not an event, it is a progressive journey. If you look at all those countries, they have just moved gradually up to the point where everybody is generally covered. So we are firmly on that path. The reforms at NHIF, the commitments of funds by the government, I think that is one of the things that uh, genders also, that is very close to our president. And so we will have laid the foundation and started the journey. Now, the other issue that I would like to say is, uh, as again, you know, looking at the theme of today uh, is uh, a healthier, you know, world, is to really emphasize on all of us as Kenyans. We have a role uh, of responsibility on preventing illness where possible. We should uh, eat healthy. We should be more involved in physical exercise. Walk where you can. Don't always rely on getting into a vehicle. Walk, eat healthy, and uh, simply, you know, keep the hygiene, keep clean. That will help a long way to reduce any uh, health uh, issues. And then finally also, seek uh, health care when you begin to notice something has changed in your body so that you don't go to the hospital when now, you know, it's almost too late. Uh, and coming on to the issue of the vaccine, I think this is uh, one area where the government has very well demonstrated the issue of equal access. Because you have to look at who are we targeting right now? Mm -hmm. Because we don't have enough vaccines uh, as, as it were. We only have one million doses. And so we have looked at our front line so that we have a, an army that continues to, you know, fight this battle for us. We have looked at uh, the police and all the security people who are front facing with the, with the population. We have also said anybody who is over 58 also needs to get the vaccine. Okay. But we have not in any way classified it along the issues of class. Any Kenyan will access the government's free vaccine at any health facility that is nearest to them and that is assigned the role of vaccination and uh, really they they should get that service at that level in 30 seconds ps because i'm running out of time mm -hmm. what do we have uh, what is the plan for the second phase 30 seconds one let us be confident that we are going to get the second lot of doses because uh, some people uh, health facilities may be holding uh, vaccines thinking that we don't have the second dose please get vaccinated if you fall in that target group after that in around may you are going to get your second dose and in fact the WHO recommends that the second dose of AstraZeneca should be in 12 weeks. Surely by that time, the vaccine will be there. So mine is just to assure the Kenyans that as a ministry, as a government, we are firmly on the path of ensuring that we fight COVID-19. We've done so well, we've done well so far, but still calling on all of us to ensure that we stick to the issue of washing hands, wearing our masks, and basically keeping the social distance. It's the only strongest weapon that we have, even as the government rolls out the vaccination program. All, all right, many thanks, Susan Machachi. She's the pr principal secretary in the Ministry of Health, and of course, all my guests, including Caroline, Dr. Waruguru, and Alan Malech. That is all for today. Uh, keep watching. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time.